now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Oakland's own Boots Riley, a hip hop legend, MC for one of the most important political rap groups of all time, The Coup. His career took an interesting turn in the last few years when he became a celebrated indie filmmaker. His first feature film, 2018, Sorry to Bother You, got everyone's attention with its extraordinary critique of racial capitalism. I think that's enough to say, except Boots, I wanted to just share really quickly, and you would never remember this, but back in the late 90s, when I was a young music journalist, just getting my start, I interviewed you on the phone, and it was a highlight of, a moment in your life was a highlight of my career. You're, you're definitely one of my heroes. So everyone, let's give a virtual welcome to Boots, Riley. Wow, thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, yeah. Uh, this is a very exciting time um, to be in, you know, um, for all the, the pain and uh, oppression and exploitation um, is something that, that we can react to in many ways. Uh, luckily for us, we're in a time where people are reacting um, in ways that are fighting back, that are standing up, that are rising up. And, um, you know, beyond the, the, uh, beyond the, the, the millions of people over the last year that have uh, hit the streets over Black Lives Matter, um, beyond the last 10 years of, of, of movements that, that have been out there that actually have dwarfed when we think about, you know, we think about radical movements, we always talk about the 60s. We've dwarfed what they were doing at that time, in the United States at least, right? Um, think about the civil rights movement. And one of the big things was the March on Washington. And uh, that was 200,000 people, right? And after having campaigned for it with support of the media, for a year and you know uh, and and all these forces coming together that was 200,000 people which was a lot however you know we we've seen since the beginning of the 2000s we've seen millions of people in the streets uh, uh, you know uh, protesting police brutality protesting uh, the uh, war the invasion of Iraq uh, we've seen things grow to this level that we haven't been at before. Um, there are other aspects to it that, that I'll talk about, but I think um, when we're at this time, we have to think about um, the different directions that this moment can go in. And um, having been involved in, in stuff since the eighties, um, I've seen things rise and fall, I've seen People get excited and then demoralized and then excited again, right? And I think it's a good thing for us to think about uh, what are the things that, that, that maybe have an impact on, uh, on what happens there. And, and, and so I, I'll, I'll take it from this standpoint. So uh, being involved in uh, anti-war movements of the early 2000s, and even to a certain extent, we saw this in Occupy, where we would have something happen where there'd be 20,000 people out on the street, 50,000 people out on the street. And a lot of the new people that come around would be saying, okay, we're here, what now? And often the answer of many of us that may have been organizers of that was like, I don't know, lift your voice up loud, let your feelings be known. And, um, and some of this is, was due to, uh, and, 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 and what, we were, what we were doing was actually misrepresenting how power works, right? And, and because of that, you have other reactions of the folks that didn't show up at the marches that are like, I'm not coming to that march. Marching isn't gonna do shit, right? Those protests aren't gonna do shit. And 
while I can say that technically they're wrong, there's a bit of truth in what some of those folks are saying, which is a demonstration in and of itself, no matter how many millions you have out there, is not the thing that affects change under capitalism. Right? The question that remains is how does power work? Because, you know, as we see, there are people being killed every day by the police, by the tools of uh, capitalist oppression and exploitation. And um, we can, you know, we just showed with millions of people that we're not down for this. And that is not enough to change it. So the, and I think what it is, is that we have, there is a way to change it, but the left has been confusing people. We have been confusing people as to how power works and therefore what the uh, answer is to changing these things. And, and, and one of those ways that we've been confusing people is this, the left, has run away from class struggle since the 1960s, for the you know, and has and I don't mean class analysis. First of all, I want to be clear that um, that that in order to that that in order to fight uh, racism, racist oppression, patriarchy. And and um, it, it, any of this, you 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 have to get rid of the system that creates it. In order, but in order to get rid of that system that creates it, you're not going to build something in which the working class is able to overthrow the ruling class if you don't at the same time fight racism, fight patriarchy, fight uh, fight. Uh, uh, um, homophobia fight you know and all of these things they're all intertwined you can't do one without the other but we've left out the we, we've left out struggling around the main motor of capitalism and the main motor of capitalism is the exploitation of labor and it's something that everybody that most of us deal with right most of us are working somewhere. And that is the place where we need to be organizing. So, and, and, and because we aren't, we've left, we've made movements for social change. We've represented them as being about spectacle and letting our voice be heard. And letting our voice be heard is maybe one step of it but we've made that be the be all end all, but it hasn't always been that way. And to, to talk about this, I need to take it back to before the new left, to the 20s and 30s in the United States. In the 20s and 30s in the United States, according to Julia Reichardt's documentary, Seeing Red, there were 1 million card carrying communists in the United States. And I'm talking about card carrying, people that were like, I'm a communist, here's my card. So that means there were a lot more people that those folks affected and that, that, that were around them, their family, their friends, all of those things. And this was at a time when the population of the United States was only 120 million people, right? Um, at that, during that time, you had stuff you had uh, militant strikes going on in Alabama, and and well, and 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 well, not only just that, the FBI uh, named these particular states as hotbeds of communist activity. States like Alabama, Montana, Utah, um, Oklahoma much less, you know, much less to be talked about, you know, like the Midwest and things like that. These were hotbeds of communist activity, places that we now think of as red states 
because they were Republican were red states because they were there were a lot of communists there. So the grand, grand great grandparents and grandparents of those folks there, they were involved in these movements, right? Um, there were were militant strikes happening in Alabama where the miners were taking up guns against the company owners. Um, things like that happening in Colorado, where actually Rockefeller sent his armed thugs out and and mowed down uh, mowed mowed down uh, miners. Uh, you had stuff happening in the Midwest where people were occupying factories, just taking them over, right? You had stuff on the on the uh, west coast. The longshoremen had had a strike. Long longshore work was thought of as the most unorganizable uh, group of folks possible because they were thought of as being the least. Uh, the, they were thought of as being the least skilled workers because they're just picking up things and moving them. And um, it was also high turnover. People were getting fired every day. And there were all these different peers that people could be on. So there was no one place to strike at. So they, so even union organi organizers sometimes would be like, that's unorganizable. But they had a militant strike in which, uh, and they won. And they had, and, and you know, the military came out. There were tanks in San Francisco shooting at longshore workers, right? And it was a, it, 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 be, it was a multiracial strike in which now, because of that, um, in the Bay Area, longshore workers are 80% black folks, right? Um, it also was multiracial in other places that the radical movement that was happening, and this was an outwardly radical move. These, these things that I'm talking about were, were not just union things. They were, they were, but they were people organizing with a radical vision saying that this is a step in us making a movement that could get rid of capitalism and create a new society in many cases like this. In places like Alabama, there's a book, uh, Hosea Hudson, Life of a Negro Communist in, in Alabama. Um, he, in the 1920s, joined the Communist Party and met a lot of people in the Communist Party in Alabama for three years. Uh, before he found out there were white people that were communists. That's how that that's how diverse and different the, the, than what we think about radical movements that were. Matter of fact, Marcus Garvey movement, which is held as like the pinnacle of black nationalism and and not necessarily thought of as uh, radical or left all the time. The folks that were running Marcus Garvey movement was a group of folks called the African Blood Brotherhood, which was a chapter of the Communist Party. Right. So we had we we had all sorts of things happening at that time. Um, there would be marches in the streets of tens of thousands of people calling for the end of capitalism and calling for other you know, other uh, militant demands. Now, it, at the same time, obviously, there were revolutions happening in other countries where, where these same sorts of things happened and, and built to an extent where they took state power, right? Where the, there was a revolution, there were things that people were inspired by where they actually took things over. And so it was in this milieu that we got probably the uh, one of well one of the two biggest liberal uh, legislative uh, achievements that have happened. Maybe one of them would be the civil rights legislation, and the other would definitely be the New Deal. And everyone talks about the New Deal in terms of FDR, but it was in this it was in this circumstance. Also, there was a thing that was hap that happened at the same time that was somewhat unrelated, but it still, you know, had the possibility of connecting, which was the bonus march. You know, a, a bunch of uh, veterans of World War One had not got their bonus checks, and they marched on the White House with their guns, and were met with tanks by General MacArthur. That's how we started hearing about General MacArthur because he met people with, with uh, tanks who were, were 
walking on the White House for the, for the, so in this time, FDR, who when he came into office, didn't have a new deal, didn't have a plan to do that. He ran and he said one time in his campaign, uh, America deserves a new deal, but he had no plan for it or anything. He developed a plan during this time while people were thinking that there could be an actual practical uh, move, revolutionary movement brewing, right? At this time, he developed the New Deal. And it was only in response to that, all of what was happening all across the United States uh, that that happened. So, it, and it wasn't because people were like, let's figure out how to cleverly get the right person in office. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with people working around where power is for the working class and that's on the job and with the uh, and and that's around and it's not just organizing on the job saying hey we don't like this can you change it it's organizing on the job saying we're shutting things down until you do this thing differently you can have the choice of having less money or no money you know so that's how people were organizing at the time and that's you know why even even though they were going for something bigger why the 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 biggest some of the biggest changes under capitalism happened was because people were organizing in that way now the question is why did that not keep happening why why did people not keep organizing with those tactics and part of it is to do with what was happening around the world at the time like i said there were revolutions around the world but there was also a move towards fascism hitler was expanding and uh revolutionary forces around the world were fighting him this before england even got involved or it, and especially for the US. And so there was a there was a push to have a united front against fascism to get the US and England involved in fighting fascism. And united front against fascism took different forms in different places. Uh, uh, you know, all these movements were connected. Definitely you US revolutionaries were in constant communication with revolutionaries from around the world. And so there was a need to make this, this happen and get the US over there to help fight Hitler. Um, and so the, what the, the form that it took in the United States was communists in the United States, radicals saying, we're, while you have the military over there, we promise we're not going to uh, have a revolution here. You know, we're not going to take advantage of that and organize during, during for for a revolution during that time. And that what we're, and and the biggest organization, the biggest radical organization in the United States at the time, went underground. Um, and what that meant was they didn't disappear necessarily. They all of a sudden they're not a communist; they're a progressive. They're not a communist, they're, you know, I don't know, Democrat or something like that and kind of trying to fuse with certain things. Um, and so you had all of a sudden, and, and mind you, I'm essentializing a lot of things right here because you can look at all these different things that happen throughout history and um, you could talk about all of these details, but to me, it's important you know, to point out that there are different big, big swings that you could look at. So, um, so all of a sudden you had all these folks going underground and now they're organizing in the community, but not necessarily, the, not, not putting out the, the radical vision that they had put out before, right? So, um, and, and at the same time they were being chased out of unions that that there was a the their retreat also bolstered right-wing forces to uh 
to to push people out even more. And and uh, and and at the same time is when we first started seeing what we now think of as nonprofit organizations, right? Uh, nonprofit organizations at first, uh, the first ones were the Rockefeller Foundations, and they have memos where they're like, look, we got to start funding this shit or there's going to be a revolution. And we can fund it and put parameters around our funding and, the, and, and, and we can have people working around poverty, but not around getting people to try to change the whole system. And, um, you know, and that, that was their open reason and that, that was them telling other folks to, to put their money in and, and let's do this. So that, that all happened. But even more so, House on American Activities Committee happened in the in the 50s. And at this time, and 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 at this time, most radicals had been, you know, operating in a different way than they had before. Whereas in the 20s and 30s, they were like, look, we're gonna do a strike, we're gonna build this movement, we're gonna shut industry down, and we're going to build a revolutionary movement and make a whole different economy, a whole different economic system and, and free ourselves in that way. They weren't saying that anymore. They were like, just like, hey, we just want, you know, we're gonna organize to get more money right here and there you go, that's it. We're gonna organize against this one, um, you know, po the police brutality and then that's it. And they, 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 they were attacking it differently. So when the House Un-American Activities Committee came and said, that person's lying to you. They're a communist. It was able to have a big effect because folks were not telling people <laughs> who they were. That was part of, because it was part of the United Front Against Fascism. Whereas had House American, uh, uh, House Un-American Activities Committee been around 15 years before, people would be, be like, yeah, I know they're a communist. They told me as they were helping me move my furniture back in the house while the, when the when they tried when the landlord tried to evict me. Like it would have been a non-issue, right? But because of the United Front Against Fascism and going underground, that was able to work. Right? And and so what in the midst of that happening and in the midst of um and, and in the midst of finding out things about Stalin that was happening in the Soviet Union and the response or non-response of the Communist Party USA to that, the biggest or biggest radical organization that we've seen to this day broke up into all these little groups, right? All those little, many of those little groups became what we then know, knew a few years later as the new left. And, and the new left did things differently. And some of them were great things. Their response to what had happened before in the last 10 years was to be out and open with uh, their radical politics. They would be like, fuck you, I'm a communist. Fuck you, I'm a revolutionary. Right. And matter of fact, that's how the House Un-American Activities Committee hearings stopped was when they came to the to San Francisco and uh, the new left folks came, you know, who were, had been former Communist Party people, some of them came and said and, and went to the meetings and literally said, fuck you, I'm a communist. And it was a rallying call and people came and 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 uh and chased house on american activities committee out of there and it became and it was a decision that said hey if we keep doing this we could make communism popular again so we don't want to do that right um same reason they chose to not call certain people to those meetings like they chose to not call harry balafonte because he was like so popular at the time that and that maybe that would have made, you know, people be excited about uh, radical politics, right? So 
anyway, that's one of the things they did. However, the other thing that happened during that time was um, that the, the new left started focusing on colleges and cities, right? So again, like hand in hand with, yes, they were, folks were getting chased out of union movements, you know, through the House on american Activities Committee, but there was a decision to focus on new areas. And so now they're not focused, they're not in Montana anymore. They're not in Utah anymore. They're not in, you know, and, and focused on students and cities. And, you know, what does that do to organizing tactics, right? Well, you can have a strike at a college, but it's not the same. I mean, a student strike. Student strike at a college is important to do and has some leverage, but it doesn't have the same leverage as say, a workplace shutting down. Right, because it's not immediately stopping profit. Right, it does have some effect because it does, a student strike does stop the works of things to a certain extent, but it's not the same. And it's not, there's not an immediate need to it. So, what happened was, what happened was, if you're focusing on students, then you start focusing on demonstrations, right? Whereas, there were always demonstrations and there always will be, but the demonstrations they had in the 20s and 30s, if you had 30,000 people out on the street, these are 30,000 people that you've organized on the, at the job site. So these are 30,000 people that are saying, we'll shut down your industry. So it was a demonstration of power, not just a demonstration of thought, right? And and, and 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 hitting things that so spectacle became and you know and, and spectacle became a big thing and matter of fact philosophers there are a number of philosophers that you know doubled down on that but it was because it was coming at a certain time and there were some things that were thought of as more real revolutionary right like certain like adventurous acts weather underground, things like that, right? That were thought of as more revolutionary. And, and But what they were doing was echoing revolutions that were happening in other parts of the world. And those revolutions had already gone through their stages where they've had general strikes and gotten to a different point. And so we had, since we're focused on spectacle, then we ended up doing a lot of different spectacle that were some, some of it was emulating other parts of the working class and other parts of the world that were at different points in their trajectory, right? And and so, but being focused on spectacle, um, you end up making up theory that allows you to keep doing what you're doing. One example of that is like just the catchphrase that you would hear and you still hear it now. The students are the revolution, right? And I think it's important to say that youth and students need to be part of the revolution. But the idea that was being put forward by the new left at the time that the students and the youth are the revolution was not necessarily historically correct. It wasn't what was happening around the world. It, it, it's not how well, I'll say this, it's not how revolutions had been made. Revolutions had been made by the working class of which students are definitely now, maybe more than then, part of it, right? Um, and, 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 but to, to, to preference students became a theoretical framework that came about because of the material condition that the left had left working, had, had abandoned for the most part again, like there, were, there were things like drum and things like that that, that were, were, were definitely different than that. But the left had abandoned organizing at the workplace. And so what happens when you have when, when the, the left focusing on students 
and spectacle. Then you got a lot of radicals that become artists, a lot of radicals that become professors, right? And what ends up happening is you create work that basically says to people that we need to do more of what we're doing, right? That we need to, so, so you, so whereas we all know the idea that theory and practice are, are inex, inextricable from each other, right? Whatever your theory is, is based on what your practice is, right? And whatever your practice is, is based on what your theory is, right? So um, if you are writing theory without being engaged in a movement that is engaged in class struggle around, and, and around the point of contradiction in capitalism, then you're gonna create theory that doesn't really reflect the work that needs to be done. You're gonna write, and you're gonna start writing things that are different because the whole point is to say something new in your next book, even though work hasn't been done in organizing since then. So you end up having a lot of people trying to say things in new ways and develop new language and new ways to do things that are avoiding the whole point, which is that we got to organize so that we can shut industry down and we got to organize on the job, all those things. So we end up having, it ends, we end up almost creating a whole separate culture from the folks that we want to organize, right? And, um, and I saw a lot of this during um, Occupy, for instance, like, I, I, Occupy excited a lot of folks, especially in Oakland, because you know there was the call out that said we're going to have a general strike. So it had some connection to this idea that people said, well, oh, if you shut things down, there's an economic impact, and I can see how that works. So a lot of people came around, and often um, you'd see like somebody come around that didn't dress like they were. Uh, you know, like whatever we thought the uh, dress code was, right? Like, oh, uh, they and people be like, oh, they must be a cop, right? Oh, they're blah blah blah, or or even if it's not that, oh, they don't really know what they're talking about because they're not using the language that we're using. They're not dressed that same way. This sort of thing, right? And um, ends up becoming very insular. But I think that, that and, and, and we would look towards figuring, and, and the reason that we end up having these ideas in this way is because if everything is based on spectacle and if everything is based on saying things in a certain way, uh, looking in a certain way, all these sorts of things, then um, when we struggle with each other, it's it, it's around something different. Um, I, I, I'll say this example is um, when I was uh, 14, I was helping uh, pass out flyers, helping the Watsonville cannery workers strike. And um, one big conflict there was that uh, in that community, the it, the, the folks. Uh, around there were, were, were mainly three groups is how it was told to me. Um, Portuguese folks, uh, Mexican and Central American folks and Filipino folks. And there was a big, uh, there were big divisions where in the past, before that point, when I come around there, like each of these groups had gone on strike separately, right? And of course it didn't work, right? And, um, and that in their communities, in the neighborhoods, people were fighting, you know, each other. There were all sorts of racist ideas between the different groups and all those sorts of situations. And, um, and, and there had been organizations who were like, oh, we all need to come together, this and that, you know, 
separate from the strike. But when this, when this strike happened, this was all of them striking together. And they were like, look, we've got to figure out, figure this stuff out because we're going to have to all strike at the same time. We're going to all have to work together in order to make this happen because we have a goal to accomplish that only us all working together can, can accomplish. So all of a sudden, all the calls for multiracial unity that were around cultural things became real because they came up, became about winning or losing a material thing, right? And from what I heard from the folks around there and saw that all of a sudden these things were happening. They had the different young folks that now saw a reason to now they got to work together and, and instead of fighting. I still think that a similar thing happens when folks are, when, when there are no winnable goals and those winnable goals a th th similar thing happens to us now on, on the left when there are no win winnable goals. People critique each other in ways that are like, I don't ever need to work with you. Fuck you. If you think this, fuck you, you're out there. And, and you can think that if you think it's all about uh, spectacle. And if you think it's all about saying the right things or just letting our vo voices be heard. However, if you understand that what we have to create is a mass militant radical labor movement that can shut down industry as a prerequisite to creating a revolutionary movement, then you understand that, no, you're saying some fucked up shit, but I need to bring you over here because I need to, I, I, we, need to, we need this group of folks because we need everybody. To work. So the critiques become different. The critiques become less sectarian. The critiques, critiques are still still there, but they're they're said in a different way because it's some someone, you know, you talk differently to somebody that you gotta work with than you do to somebody you don't have to work with. Right. And some of that comes and that and 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 that is changed by how we think power works and um and and it also changes the things that we will do so during you know during black lives matter um the longshoremen who are still the most militant labor organization um you know out there the the uh, local 12 here like i said still mainly black folks still um militant because you know it's the ports they shut shit down like they don't like something they shut it down boom and they're organized and together and one reason they're the most militant union is that during the the 50s during the house on american activities hearings they said we don't they said we don't care if people are communists we want them As a matter of fact the lead guy was a communist obviously but um because of that they remained the most radical movement, I mean, gr uh, labor group, and um, maybe outside of the IWW, but the most radical ones that can actually shut down an industry currently um, are there and, and they're the most militant. And so they, they shut down the whole West Coast during Black Lives Matter uh, uh, as a one day thing, it's symbolic. And it, it didn't, ha does it, those symbolic things for that don't necessarily have as much power because the boss just organizes around it. Like, okay, we're going to bring those in the next day instead. But it was very, a very important symbolic message they were sending out, which was saying, here is a way that we have to organize against this. This is how, what power hears. And it's not just that power hears it, like in the sense that, 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 oh, they're shutting down industry. Let's, some some vague person response. The folks that run these industries are the folks that are determining policy. They're the folks that are writing, that are literally sitting there writing policy for the elected politicians. We learned that with the Enron scandal where uh, energy companies had literally had written on paper telling the president what his energy policy was, right? And that's how things work. So 
if you want to control what policy is, you got to, if you, then, then it's not from the elected officials, it's from their puppeteers. And how do you control their puppeteers? You shut shit down, you shut industry down. And, um, and, and matter of fact, they're, they're very scared of that. Tesla workers got inspired by uh, the longshore workers that day, and they also walked out. The, the Bay Area Tesla workers walked out. Uh, Elon Musk got so scared that within a few minutes, he then said, hey, everybody's got the day off. You know, like, so it seemed like it wasn't a walkout and it seemed like it, it didn't have uh, any effect. They're scared of that sort of thing move, move, moving. I always say, what if in St. Louis, the left that was there was organizing with a radical vision in the, was organizing in industry there in, in St. Louis for the, la, for the 10 years before that. If they could have shut down a quarter of industry, even a fifth of industry um, once Mike Jones got killed, you could have had an indictment right away. Probably wouldn't even have needed that much. But the point is, is that power, uh, you know, the capitalists are who run things. Our power is in the sense that it, it comes, stems from the fact that we work and we're exploited. And our power, uh, being able to exercise our power comes from us being able to collectivize that. Us being able to collectivize our struggle. And class struggle is only going to happen when we are able to organize on the job and shut things down. And there, that is, those are the advances that we're going to make. And those are the pieces of power that can't be taken from us because we're organizing with each other. Much different than getting the right person in office if that can happen because that goes away. And the, the power comes, comes from being able to shut down industry. So um, I'll say this, that this is an exciting time. One reason it's exciting is not just that we saw these, you know, we saw millions of people in the street, that's exciting. But in the last, since from March to January, according to paydayreport.com who keeps track of this stuff, there were 1300 strikes in the United States. 1,300, there's another question as to why that's not reported, right? And why that's not being uh, trumpeted out there, right? 1,300 strikes, most of them wildcat strikes, um, you know, including really big ones like 13,000 carpenters in, on, the wet, on the East Coast went on strike. Um, and, and again, wildcat strikes, meaning the, the, the union heads weren't down with it and the, the base of them said, we're going on strike anyway. Some of them were radical, right? You had the, uh, many people may have heard of the, 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 the folks that were making uh, jet engines who shut down their factory and, and one of their demands was, we're not making jet engines anymore. We want to make respirators for people, right? So these are, are, are radical connections that folks are making and that's the future of where we got to go. There's a, there's a documentary called Rocking the Foundations. It's on YouTube. Um, and it's about the Building Laborers uh, Federation of Sydney, Australia in the 60s and 70s. This was a Oh, a, a union that started out like very corporate controlled, making deals with the bosses and all that kind of stuff. But in the 60s, they got taken over by radicals. They became really militant in order to, to, to win their strikes. They would even show up at Scab's houses and beat them up. And they were like able to just win all their strikes. Then they were like, okay, we're able to win all our strikes for our things. How do we make this more radical? So they linked up they, they looked for things that they could link up and use their power for. 
And in Sydney, which is a whole, whole different city, whole different area in Australia, um, Aboriginal folks and others were fighting gentrification that was happening there. And the big developer that was trying to gentrify this one neighborhood happened to be building buildings in Melbourne. I mean, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. There in Sydney, the, 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 the neighborhood organizations were in Melbourne. They shut down all that, that developers building, uh, buildings until that developer pulled out of that neighborhood, right? That's the power that we had. Now they, you could have you know, protested the developer and been like, we're gonna make your life hell. We're gonna like bring chaos, but they don't care about that. What they care about is the, the, is the wealth that brings them power. And we're in a new exciting time, like I said, that, that 1,300 strikes, that's the biggest strike wave that the United States has had since the 40s. We're not hearing about it because they don't want anyone, they don't want the duplications, right? It's the biggest strike wave since the 40s. Right now, you know, and this has been on surveys since for the last 10 years, millennials, and this is all sorts of surveys, left and right, keep coming up with these similar numbers. 51% of millennials say they want a socialist society. 43% of all ages say they want a socialist society, right? The question is, how do we get it? And, and that is why we gotta engage in class struggle. That is how we get rid, that, this is how we stop racist oppression. This is how we have, a say in uh, against patriarchal oppression. This is how we we uh, create a new world in which in, in which people have democratic control over the wealth that we create with our labor. And I think uh, I don't know how to end it. Bing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Boots. You're getting virtual applauses and we can't even hear it. Cool. So, thank you for dropping all that knowledge. You are, I, I, you're a rapper and a, a filmmaker and also a historical scholar, which, which I kind of forgot about, but you have always shared that knowledge, so. Yeah, I don't know uh, if I could say that, but yeah. Well, your critique of higher ed, you know, like, it, it, you know, people who are deemed experts, you know, aren't always who are the real experts here. But um, we're going to do a Q&A. So like I said, uh, the, easy, the best way, audience, folks, community members, the best way to, to communicate here would be by raising your hand and, and, and talking and turning, off, turning on your camera. Yeah. Because yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be asked something about this, but something I left out that's inspiring about the little things we do that affect uh, a lot more. So um, many of you know, in 2011, when Occupy Oakland happened, we had a general strike. 50,000 people came under the banner of smash capitalism, shut down the the uh, the. Uh, ports around here and it was it was a symbolic thing but it was important um a month later uh there was a, a crisis happening in nigeria in nigeria they uh the the there's a subsidy that the they're oil rich country but the oil gets exported and um processed and then get sold back to the country. So it costs a lot of money. Um, and the one form of social welfare program they have there is that the government subsidizes the oil that people buy back. Cause there's, there's not an electrical grid. So to light your house, to heat your house, everything you need this, this oil. Um, and so there's a subsidy that, that to, to make the oil cheap enough for people to afford. And the government announced they were taking away that subsidy, right? But there had been an Occupy Nigeria that came up after they heard about what was going on in Oakland and Occupy Nigeria 
called for a general strike inspired by what they had heard was going on in Oakland. Now ours wasn't that <laughs> big, but it was like they heard about it and they did a, they did a general strike in Nigeria um, in which everything got shut down in which they, the um, airports, train stations, every, everything, oil pumps stopped working, right? All over Nigeria. And uh, they, they announced that, you know, hey, we're part of this worldwide thing. Occupy Oakland did it, now we're doing it. They obviously did it way bigger. They even had like their own like memes going on, like strike Nigeria style where they would, uh, or occupy Nigeria style where they move their whole living room furniture out into the street. And there were it, like in every city, there were 200,000 people gathering on the street, right? Um, they, they won to a certain extent, they got sold out by uh, some of the union heads that were working with the president. Uh, but so they didn't get everything that they were asking for, but they got, you know, like if right here is where the, where the price was be, before the subsidies got taken away and right here is where it was when it got taken away, they got it back down to here, right? So, um, you know, and, and uh, so what we're doing on all these things are very inspired. So this jacket I'm wearing is from Italian railway thing. So right after uh, the Occupy Oakland action, we had the coup had, had a tour and we were in Italy. And um, the first thing that happened was, you know, we, we, we have like Q and A's sometimes after our shows. And um, we were in Venice, Italy, and the, uh, the students there said, what was the reaction in Oakland when we stopped that train for them? And we were like, what, what are you talking about? And they were like, yeah, uh, we stopped the train from coming through Venice that was carrying something. I, I kind of don't know, but the, we didn't hear about this, but they had like hundreds of students in solidarity with Occupy Oakland doing that, right? Separately from that, then we went down to Rome and we were playing at a, a squat called Strike. It's an anarchist squat called Strike. And squats there are different than squats here. It's something that they've taken over, uh, a, a building they've taken over uh, illegally, but they usually like make them into these beautiful venues. They have so many people working on it. And, and, uh, you, and so this was a venue that we were playing at called Strike. Next door to the venue was the was the place where they um, where they fix trains. Was it like it looks like a factory, but they're just fixing the trains. And the workers there had had a tenuous relationship with the folks, the anarchist folks at the squat, and kind of like feeling like they're you know good for nothing, blah blah blah. They don't do anything. Well, um, they're they're their factory was about to get shut down and they came to strike the squat and said, what should we do? Like after, you know, like not liking those folks, they were like, you might have the answer. And they said, uh, you should occupy the place. And they were like, cool, we're gonna occupy it. So we go to play strike, we go to play the venue and they're like, boots, we." told the workers here, you're gonna come talk to them. So I went over there, they've got the thing occupied. They've been occupying it for, you know, uh, a few weeks. And, um, and you know, I took a tour of it. They gave me the jacket and all this kind of stuff. And then I was like, so um, what are you gonna do now? Cause it, it was a thing where they were, it's hard to explain, but Basically, I was like, so what are you gonna do now? And they said, well, I thought that's why you're here because um, they said that you did this at Occupy Oakland. And so we did it because we heard that you did, the, did it in Occupy Oakland. So we were hoping you could tell us. And I was like, oh shit. Um, obviously I don't have the answer for them. I mean, 
some of it, it was an interesting thing. Some of it was like, maybe you could retool this and uh, make parts and sell them to Venezuela, all those sorts of things. Cause there, there is this other interesting uh, uh, documentary uh, about that by uh, the woman that made the book, No Logo. Why am I forgetting her name? Um, uh, somebody knows it. Someone will, someone will know, I forget yeah. too. Anyway, there's a documentary about that happening in Argentina. Anyway, um, but the point is, is that, and those workers eventually won, uh, not due to anything that I talked to them about. But um, the point is, is that this stuff really affects people. What we do here, what we do now has an effect um, internationally, nationally, locally, and historically. So we're in we're we're in in a time of exciting opportunity. Yeah, that's dope to hear about Oakland, Occupy, inspiring a, a world away, and vice versa. Okay, 